You are welcome in this place and you are welcome in us. Help us to want you. In your name we pray. You may be seated. For a little bit longer this time, which is nice. So as we begin this message, I would like us just to take a few moments like we did last week. We've been having these habit conversations, right? The first week was kind of introduction to what we're doing. Then we talked about our job for one week was to go out and bless three people, one of whom wasn't a part of our church. And then last week we talked about having a meal with three people, one of whom wasn't in our church, and bless three people for a second week. So here's what I can do. Turn to a neighbor and just have a quick second about some meal that you had this week that was meaningful. Can you do that? Ready to go. Okay, for those who are introverts, they've had enough. (laughs) So take a deep breath and give them space. They're all going to be wearing red stickers next week. (laughs) So I had uh, a very interesting meal last night with uh, the Lechners, and it was just a great kind of spontaneous meal. But can I tell you, one of the things that deeply blessed me in that meal, as a dad of young kids. I have an eight-year-old and a soon-to-be five-year-old. Just having Katie look across the table and say to me twice, it's not always going to be like this. (laughs) I can't tell you truthfully, and I mean this in the core of my being, how healing it was, right? And to be sitting across the table from their amazing son, who is a senior in high school, and like all of us would want our senior in high school to be, no pressure. <laughs> and to realize not only is she proclaiming that truth over us and sharing that meal, she has an example of that truth. This is the power of what happens when we share meals with each other. So we're in the middle of this series called Five Missional Habits. And we pointed out that missional people are focused on mission for God, right? The kind of theology behind this is we're not just taking on our own mission. We're living into what God's mission is for his church in the world, which is about redeeming creation and building the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, which we pray every week. So all believers then are called and commissioned by Christ to make disciples as we go in our world, right? As you're going to the doctor, as you're going uh, to your work, as you're going to school, as you're going, you are already called and commissioned to be God's hands and feet in this world. So we've said that living this kind of questionable life, right, a life that's worth our neighbors asking us questions about requires that we have some different habits, And those habits kind of move in three different ways. There are are habits that are really outward, right? The, The blessing and the meal is a very outward expression of what it means to connect with God through our neighbors and our community. But some of the habits we're going to talk about the next two weeks are about inward connection. They're about, or even better, kind of upward connection. How are we connecting with the God who empowers us to be God's hands and feet. 
And so as we move into the next two weeks, as we move today into the idea of the habit of listening, part of what that listening requires of us is that we hear and connect with the Spirit. You'll notice that Nathan picked songs that all had to do with how the Spirit is coming and coming around us and empowering us. We have this beautiful passage from Romans that Manda read to us about how we had this old way of life. And really the truth is this old way of life didn't lead to freedom. It led to mess and chaos. But Jesus has given us a new way of life. And it is a way of life that's abundant and leads to freedom. Freedom beyond what we can possibly even imagine. But part of the work of this journey of faith that we're on, starting long before we get our Bibles in church and going until we're Cheryl's age and entering an assisted living site, that part of the work we're doing through that entire journey And I love this passage, giving a good burial to our old life, right? Some of us, we just need to give a good burial to that old life and step into the new life that God's given us. Another passage talks about you can't come out of the grave still wearing the grave clothes because you still stink, (laughs) right? So we've got to shed the old clothes, and sometimes that's hard. So as we move forward, hear this. We can meet the grace of Jesus once, and it can change our world and eternity. And that's beautiful, and I don't want to downplay that or make that less important than it is. But hear this. You can actually tap into this Christ being of the Holy Spirit who resides in us every day and leave that thing, that old life, buried. I don't know about you, I like to dig up my old life like a good zombie movie, (laughs) right? It's my favorite. Nathan loves zombie movies too. We talk about it all the time. And I like to dig it up and I like to give it a new resurrection all the time. And so Part of what we're talking about as we move forward into this passage is to daily bathe ourselves in the grace of Jesus. Being awakened to the grace of Jesus that changes our vision for ourselves and how we see ourselves, but it also changes our vision for how we see our neighbor, and it changes our vision for how we even see God. Now, this doesn't happen to me very often because I don't, I'm not a dreamer. My wife dreams all the time. Sometimes I wake up in trouble because of the things my wife dreamed. <laughs> Anybody been there? Um, I think that maybe why God blesses me without having dreams, I don't really know. I don't really have dreams. But literally last night, I'm laying in bed after leaving the Lechners and 3.30, I have this weird dream of somebody who's I went to high school with that I've not thought about in forever. And she looked at me and she said, Rustin, what are you preaching on? And I said, well, you know, like she knows, she doesn't know at all. I said, Lacey, you know? And she's like, yeah, talk about it. So I I walked through the past three weeks with her. And she said, when are you actually going to say something? (laughs) Well, then I woke up. As you do. And when I woke up, one of the first images that I had in my mind was of Dave Pierce. And Dave Pierce and I have kind of weekly, monthly conversations about stuff. I don't even know if he's here today or not. But one of the things that Dave and I have been having conversation of is the book of Galatians. Right, Dave? He's back here. We've been having this ongoing conversation about Galatians. And I love this book. And it was like one of those things where this wasn't a part of the sermon originally, but God was like, hey, wake up. And so I woke up and I was like, okay, Dave has a message for me that actually the Holy Spirit had for me. And it was like, bam. So here you go. You're going to get this. (laughs) I think that 
the church in America is very similar to the church in Galatia. Now, if you know anything about that story, I'm getting hot. If you know anything about that story in the book of Galatians, the people in the church there had decided that they needed to put on a new law, right? They had been freed from the law by the grace of Jesus Christ. And yet, when new people were joining the church, they were giving them all these rules. Rules, rules, rules. Here's what it means to be good. Here's what it means to be right. Here's what it means for you to do this. You have to do this and this and this. You need to be circumcised. You need to do this. And then, and then you get to experience the grace of God. Now, the conversation in the church in America has shifted off of circumcision, thank God. <laughs> but we're still trying to give people a bunch of rules to experience God's grace. Instead of just saying, Jesus did it. That's it. It's done. There's nothing you have to do. Jesus did the work. You just have to live into that life. You have to awaken yourself, allow the Spirit to flood your being and wake up to the power that the same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is in you every single day. Amen. So Galatians 3.22 says, for if any kind of rule-keeping had power to create life in us, we would have certainly gotten it by this time. Anybody got power from rule-keeping recently in your life? It says, is it not clear to you that to go back to that old rule-keeping, peer-pleasing religion would be an abandonment of everything personal and free in your relationship with God. And Paul says, I refuse to do that. I refuse to repudiate God's grace. If a living relationship with God could come from rule-keeping then Christ died for nothing. If we're able to receive God's life, his spirit in and with us by believing just the way Abraham received it, you can tell them for sure that you are now fully adopted as children. Because God sent his spirit of his son into our lives, crying out, Papa, Father. Doesn't that privilege of intimate conversation with God make it plain that you are not a slave, but a child? You're not a slave, but a child. And if you're a child, you're also an heir with complete access. Not my words, Paul's. Then he goes on in chapter 5, verse 4 and 6, and he says, when you attempt to live by your own religious plans and projects, you're cut off from Christ. You fall away from the grace that's already there. Meanwhile, we expectantly wait for a satisfying relationship with the Spirit. For in Christ, neither our most conscientious religion nor disregard to religion amounts to anything. What matters is something far more interior. Faith expressed in love. So Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never again allow anyone to harness slavery on you. Not church. Not the world, no one. Because it's absolutely clear that God has called you to this free life. Just make sure that you don't use your freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Because that's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. 
That is a true act of freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time, you will be annihilating each other. And then where's your precious freedom? So my counsel is this. Live freely, animated and motivated by God's spirit. This is what this habit is all about. Being animated and motivated by God's spirit. To be animated and motivated by God's spirit, somehow we've got to be able to hear the spirit of God. Somehow we have to learn how to listen more attentively. So if we want to stay tapped into this love and grace of Jesus through the power of the Spirit, we have to listen to the God who placed that Spirit within us. I don't know about you, for me as an extrovert, blessing other people is relatively easy. You know, you just buy someone's coffee here, you do this, and as an extrovert, anybody want to have a meal, just give me a call, I'm in. <laughs> I ate with at least three different families this week. And that's not because I had three different ones I had to do to check my little box. It's because I just like to eat with people. But this, this listening, if I'm honest, it's super hard for me. It's super hard for me. We've become so adept at confirming what we believe or think or understand that we've actually abandoned the process of listening and thinking again and allowing the Spirit to enliven and motivate us. Even my social media puts me in people who agree exactly with what I agree with. It's like rigged against us to listen. Now there's, I think, three really important types of listening. And they kind of build on each other. The first listening is just listening to ourselves. It's called self-awareness. It's knowing what we think and what we feel. It's knowing what our body is telling us, what drives us and energizes us. And I think it's a really important first step into knowing God's will. I think it's part of why when Paul and when Jesus talk about understanding love, they also talk about that we have to love ourselves that there's something that happens when we touch and get in tune with what's happening in us. And sometimes in life, in applying these habits to become highly missional people, we get in our own way. I don't know you, but a lot of the messages that I hear inside of myself aren't positive ones. They're messages that I were handed to by my family or messages that I was handed from a broken church, or messages that I took on because of my own shame and guilt. And so I've been in this kind of struggle in adulthood of under, trying to understand like which messages that I'm sensing of myself are coming from God and which ones are coming from my brokenness. And part of paying attention to God means I learn how to pay attention and to discern that and begin to listen to what God might be trying to say to me like Paul saying to Galatians, Galatians, you are children, not slaves. Stop jumping in the slave train and instead jump on the freedom train. Our feelings don't define us. Our feelings don't define how God sees us. So if you need to hear it today, hear me clearly. God loves you just as you are in this moment, fully and wholly. You are loved by the one who created you and set you into motion beyond measure. And there's nothing, neither height nor low, angels nor demons, principalities or powers that can separate you from that love. 
And once we get that, once we tap into that listening and we feel the vibration of God's love in us and begin to believe that God loves us the way that he's calling us to love ourselves, then, then we can start listening to others. And this isn't step by step. It's not like you got to learn how to love yourself before you can listen to other people. This is all happening simultaneously. It's multidimensional, just like our lives. So we're listening to others. And in this type of listen, it's harder than we realize. Often when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about the next thing I'm going to say to you. That's not really listening. So if you're sitting in a room with somebody you love or somebody you hate and having a conversation and you're already thinking about what you're going to respond, tell yourself to stop it. Stop it. Hear them. Receive them. Receive them fully as they are without trying to shape or mold or change. Just listen and let them be. And then think for a moment in your mind and say, the same way that God loves me, God loves them. Now what do I have to say? What do I have to say in response to the story that's been graciously shared with me. You may be able at that point to then empathize and to connect like Katie did for us last night as we were like saying an eight-year-old is crazy (laughs) and saying to us, it changes, just hold on. Because she heard and not only did she hear, She remembered. She remembered what it was like to have a crazy eight-year-old. And then she spoke truth out of love to Heather and I. See, listening well to others opens us up to engage around ideas that might be new or different. Feelings that might seem messy struggles and joys that are authentic and real. And many of us need to open ourselves up to understanding that God might be trying to say something new to us that might change how we see and understand the world. Now, Dave won't mind me telling you this. Dave and I agree on about 2% of things. (laughs) Right? But you know what we agree most on? I have no doubt in the core of my being that God loves Dave as much as he loves me. And I have no doubt that Dave believes that God loves me as much as he loves him. And together, we have no doubt that what God has called us into is to recklessly abandon ourselves into his grace because there's nothing that we can do to make it different anyway. And so together, connected, We learn from each other. I see the world differently because Dave shares his story with me. Dave sees the world differently because he allows me to share my story and thoughts with him. And together we enter this process of unlearning and rethinking and allowing the Spirit of God to do this kind of cosmic dance with us, inviting us in to what God is doing in the world. And this third type of listening for me is the hardest This is the listening to God part because I don't get dreams regularly. In fact, I have never gotten a dream that I've ever preached about until today. (laughs) Forty-something years in, 42 I think I am now, never. Been preaching for 20 years. So for me, part of how I listen to God is what we invited these kids into today. Connecting with the sacred texts, the stories of those who had come before us. Right, So it was not a surprise to me at 3.30 this morning after that conversation, seeing Dave in my mind and then responding that, oh, Galatians, I know Galatians. I've studied Galatians. This isn't a new story to me. I didn't have to wake up in the morning and do an in-depth Bible study of Galatians because I've poured my life into Galatians. I've saw myself in the book of Galatians. And so God has that now as a capacity to speak and engage me because the text lives in me. That's what we're inviting our children into. 
through Sunday school and through coloring pages and through music and through story time and through these milestones is to start allowing those seeds of the word of God to be birthed within them so that when God speaks, they can hear. But also for me, some of it, you know, usually I have my prayer beads on. And a good half of you have asked me why I wear the beads. They're prayer beads for me because my brain doesn't stop. And I know some of you are the same way. It just keeps going and going and going and you can't stop it at night and finally you knock yourself out enough to fall asleep. For me, the prayer beads and that I use them to pray to center myself. And often I use a very simple prayer. It says, Son of God, have mercy on me. Son of God, have mercy on me. And I do that for about 10 to 15 minutes, just rolling the beads in my hand. And then there's a sense of calmness. And then I can listen and pay attention and ask God, what do you have to say to me? And frequently, in that practice of my life, God will bring up a person, an image of a person that I've talked to or an instance. I remember about three years ago, right before I left Minnesota, so two years ago, one of the practices that I do is I start my morning as I look through my agenda and I say, God, what would you like to change? because I always have a big agenda that's not God's. And what would you like to change? What would you like to shape? And I'd been praying for this family who the husband was dying and his kids had come into, back into town as uh, they were beginning the process of letting go of their dad. And I had planned to go see them the next day. And I said to God, God, I really don't have time for that today. And he was like, yeah, you do. And so I cleared my schedule, I called, said, hey, I'm going to come over and, and see you guys today. Is that okay? Yeah, please come. So I'm sitting there, we go into the room, and I'm with Jim, and he's amazing, and he's just entering into this new life after this life. And it's a beautiful, graceful moment that I get to be a part of. And then the children and I go into the next room, and we're praying and chatting and talking about their dad. And then the mom comes in and she says, I think it's happening. And so we go in the room and we say a prayer. We're holding hands and the kids start to sing Amazing Grace because that's their dad's favorite song because songs matter. And I get to be a part of this holy moment because I listened. That's it. Not because I'm worthy, not because having your pastor there when you die, let me tell you, it doesn't mean anything other than I get to walk alongside you in that. Having Dennis or Lynn or anybody else in this room next to you when you die is just as good as having me because the Spirit of God is in all of us, right? And yet I got to be a part. So as we learn to start paying attention, how does the Spirit speak to you? What is it? the way, that, and, and the Spirit will use what you're connected to, right? So if you're a music person, the Spirit of God's going to speak to you through music because God knows you and he knows how you need to hear. And so whatever it is, give yourself the time, give yourself a moment to begin to hear the Spirit of God in your life and then move, Right? Don't move and then listen. Listen and then move. So this is the challenge for this week. Take at least one 20-minute block of your week to listen to the Spirit of God and then respond. It's that simple and difficult. One 20-minute block Schedule it, block it out. If you're a block scheduler like me, block it out. Put it on your calendar, line it up. Type A people, you're with me. Do it. Put it on there and save it. And part of that's going to require some new habits. You're going to have to turn off your cell phone, turn off your computer. If you're like me, you need to put it in another room because if it's in the room, I can't, it's energy connects to me. <laughs> and I'm like, what's on that beautiful device that's sucking me in? So put it in another room and just... Listen, no music, no distractions, no nothing. 10, 15 minutes, and then watch God speak.
and listen. Please pray with me. God, we want to hear you. And yet we're distracted. We want to be moved by you. And yet we put roadblocks in the way. God, we want to be free like Paul talks about. Recklessly abandoned to your grace. Moved by your love to love ourselves, to love our neighbor, and to love others. And yet we dig up the old body. So God, forgive us. Free us, liberate us to be your children, fully loved, fully adopted, fully connected to your spirit. Amen.